Happy holidays, and I hope you're staying warm. I don't know if there's anywhere in the United States where it's not cold right now. So thank you for joining us. I hope you've got a nice hot cup of tea, and we'll get started. My name's Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager for the Handweavers Guild of America. We're excited you're joining us today, and I get to be your host today. Uh, we want to thank our sponsor, it is Myrna Lindstrom. Myrna, you are a sweetheart to do this. We really do appreciate you um, stepping up and being a sponsor so we can keep doing textiles and tea. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the program today, as always. Please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. Um, I can't see them today at all if they're in the chat. And I would love to hear your, uh, your questions. We love your comments. Keep those coming. Those are great. But if you do want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A. Today, we have someone who's not freezing because she's down in New Zealand. Today, we have Christine, and we're excited to have her here today. Christine Keller was born in New Zealand, um, was born in Germany. I'm sorry. She was born in Germany and then she she now lives in New Zealand. She holds an MFA from Concordia University in Montreal. All of our Canadians are on watching today. She has a master equivalent from the Gesamthochschule Unikassel in Germany. She learned weaving in the traditional apprenticeship style in Hamburg. She has exhibited internationally since 1987. She, has the, she is the academic leader of the textile section of the Dunedin School of Art uh, in Otago Polytech until 2010. And then in 2012, she started the weaving studio in Dunedin. She uses her art to tell contemporary stories about science, environment, community, power, and value. She examines the clash of tradition and new technology and the social and the political implications that emerge from this tension. We'll talk more about this today. Hi, Christine, it's wonderful to have you here. Hello, thank you for having me. And I just saw Louise Limubirubi to come online and she has been a big mentor for me. So greetings to Louise especially and greetings to anybody else especially in Canada, where I used to live, but also to everybody. Yes. Very Hello. international group today. Hi, Louise. We love having you on, too. Thank you. 
Okay, we're going to start with the important question, which is, what is your favorite tea? And you got to tell us about your mug. <laughs> yes, okay, my favorite tea is Earl Grey. I know that will not please everybody. And at the moment, because I just had a coffee, I'm having a licorice tea in here. And my special <laughs> cup here says on the back, Schwarzes Schaf war gestern. That means the black sheep was yesterday. So the family special outsider person now is not the black sheep as such anymore. It's just <laughs> a bit of a special character. So that's yes. a great mug. That's Eva, take thing. that coffee, love. Mandy, what? we can hear you, Mandy. Sorry, um, about that. thank you. Okay, um, you uh, you said that. Can you talk a little bit about how you got started in fiber? Um, we talked some about the introduction, me, but more detail. Yeah, the, the beginning of fiber with me was actually, it has always been my, in my life. When I was very little, other people would maybe stick little things into their mouth. And I had, the, when at age two, apparently, <laughs> I had the button box of my mom and I sorted them in colors and sizes and patterns. And so... I've been making patterns from very early on. And when I was asked what a particular color was, I said turquoise green, rather than a baby would say green or blue or something. So I was very particular about that. And I did um, knitting and fine macrame as a teenager and was quite lost at the end of high school. Um, I was very late developer. And one uh, mother of a friend said that she knows the person who trains um, weavers and they were, they were looking for an apprentice. And I was 19 years old and I thought if I finish that, I would be 21 and I could still do something else because I was really, I, I was thinking of studying mathematics or chemistry, but I could not imagine what that was good for. <laughs> and I'm a very practical person and I couldn't see how that could be applied. And so started weaving. And then I thought as well as I've started this now, I should stick with it. And I studied textile design. That's, that's interesting when you're like, I don't know what I can do with this. That's good. Well, you have talked about, you have three pillars that is central to your work and they are teaching, art and social outreach. Now, how did those come about and that, why are those so important to you? So I come from a teachers and social workers family somehow. And when I grew up, I, I thought I want to be anything but a teacher because <laughs> everybody around me was teacher. And I found that was quite boring. My mother was a social worker, but she only started really her own professional life again when I was in my teenage years. Uh -huh. um, because she had brought us up and been the housewife. And I thought I wanted to do something completely different. And um, yeah, got into textiles. And so that started. But when I studied textile design, I was quite depressed by all the mass production. And I thought we are producing way too much stuff that people don't need. So I didn't really want to be the industrial designer, but mm. um, I basically, um, I, I did love people. I do love people and I kind of can explain things step by step. I think, I hope quite well. And uh, so, yes, I, um, I became, I am a teacher by default, I had to learn. I am the artist because I did love to create things, but because I have a concern for the planet and the people, um, I also feel the urge to do more um, systemic, like tackle systemic questions, like the, so that's mm -hmm. where the social, social outreach comes from. Yeah, I, said, I think- By the way, I can, I can just tell you about this little. Oh, good, um, good. I was going to ask you. Yeah. Stone I'm wearing here, like you know, in, in New Zealand, lots of people have the green stone, which is the New Zealand jade, and they say that those pendants they come to you, so you're not normally going and buying yourself one. It's like somebody gives you one, and that's the one that should match. And this one is the shape of the sweet potato, 
And it's also the shape of the twist. And the twist means friendship, like it means that people are tangled together. And the food part of it means hospitality. So it is really about caring for people and the hospitality. So that is um, pretty much, I'm gonna sit for a moment so that you can look at that, but that's quite yeah, important. Yeah, that's lovely. That's lovely. You, yes. uh, you, it's always interesting because of, of, we keep interviewing all these artists, these fiber artists who have a really strong relationship with science. And we'll see more of this today as you talk about your work, but your work a lot of times is about science, not just that you have a strong relationship about science, you bring it into your work. And this piece right here is a great example about that. So would you, one, talk about this piece, but also talk about the importance of weaving and science for you? Yes, yeah, so um, what we see here is an image. This is like, it's the same piece in, um, in light and in dark, and it has glow in the dark threads in it. And it is um, an aurora. Uh, aurora australis, not the aurora borealis as you, as you have up there. So it's an image of the of a reflection in the water of the aurora here in Dunedin in my city. And um, what happens is we have at the university here, we have a big center of science communication. And we have um, one of the um, teaching fellows there, Steve Ting, he's one of my long year students and another long year friend and student is Pam McKinley who organizes those exhibitions that are about art and science. And so um, it's really uh, to, to bring science to the, to the broader uh, surrounding of people is quite important. I think, and, and today in the time when we suddenly have the flat earth societies popping up like mushrooms again, uh, <laughs> where suddenly things that we took for granted as proven by science are suddenly taken for alternative realities or something like that. I think it's even more important to, to have um, science to, yeah, to, to communicate science to the crowd and art could be one of the tools to do that. And do you want me to explain why this, why the Aurora is science or what's the science? Yeah, please this talk piece? about so, this piece. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, so this is called Excited uh, Oxygen and I worked with uh, Dr. Faye Nelson and she is a paleomagnetist and that is a person that works about the history of the magnetic field in the earth, like over hundreds and millions of years. And so what she explained to me is that she, um, the, of course the Aurora has more colors than just the green, but as maybe some textile people know, the green glow in the dark is the easiest to get. So the green light and the Auroras is done by excited oxygen molecules. So the, um, we have an atmosphere, so you need an atmosphere and you need um, the solar um, particles that are hitting the atmosphere and they push the electrons and the molecules higher, closer to the, um, to the center of the atom, so they energize them. And that is the ex excited state of the oxygen. And as the oxygen kind of unexcites, relaxes, um, the electron comes back and it emits this green light. And um, so basically um, she said that having a green aurora is actually the basis for having life on earth because it means that there is oxygen in the atmosphere. And the first oxygen that came on the planet was oxidizing all the iron. So everything rusted oh. first. And when all the iron that was on the, in, on the surface had rusted, then the first breath has been taken. And so um, this exhibition had the subject art and air. And I always wanted to do something with the glow and the dark stuff, which I already had back when I was in Montreal. And um, this has finally come out in this piece. So is this a loom woven piece? Um, it kind of looks yes. like it, it's a, a tapestry. No, it's a loom woven piece 
with um, so it is technically it's woven sideways. It's woven on a 24 shaft AVL loom. Uh -huh. And um, what it is, it has a background um, that is just a twill. So this is all twill yeah. based. Yeah. And then it has different um, layers of um, you probably can't see my mouse, can you? No. no. Um, it has different layers of um, inlay on top. So the um, okay. there is a gray. If you look on the left, the the thing that's the land is merino possum because we have sheep and possums on the land, and then the sky and the water is different uh, glow in the dark yarns, and they are inlaid in different twill variations. So it's just I just put different amounts of the glow in the dark to get the different brightness. Yeah. Now we've already asked got people asking this, but is this? Um, I'm assuming this is um, 2D. It's not. It's a flat woven piece, right? Yeah, it's a flat woven piece, and uh -huh. it's about um, 80 centimeter high and one meter 20 or so, one meter 30 wide. Okay. Yeah. All right. That was the next question. Was, and then um, the. Um, the glow in the dark was inlaid. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is discontinuous. So, but it's not a tapestry because it is basically just laid on top. All right. So you could. Did you have some in the call, warp also? Um, just in the middle, in the very middle of it, okay. there was some in the warp because that's where, um, in the middle is where the most light was. So there was about six inches that had a bit of a warp as well, mm -hmm. just to make it the most intense stripe. Okay, right. Well, I was just wondering, I could see the stripes on in the, I didn't know that that was part of the glow in the dark. Yeah, that's not. the weft, because it's woven sideways, that's the weft, oh, the oh. lines you see. I missed that. Thank you for clarifying that. I yes, completely missed that. It's woven sideways and that's okay. the weft laid in. And the, and the thin stripes is like mm -hmm. the thickness of sewing thread, but maybe three of them. So that's about six thicknesses of sewing thread gives you that thinnest line there. Wow. And the other one is quite a thick yarn that is then in some parts taken double. And it's a bit of pick up to get this very irregular twill variation because, um, because obviously the, world, the the air is twirling around and I wanted to get a bit of movement in there. Oh, it's an amazing piece. I'm so glad we were able to see the how it glows as well as actual structure yes. of it. Yes, and yeah. the, and the uh, yeah, thanks for the photographs by Steve Ting, by that guy that is teaching <laughs> the, uh, the science communication because he's a filmmaker and a photographer as well by trade. So I'm very lucky that he wants to support us always and just says oh i just take those photos for you which is brilliant thank yes you. thank you steve we appreciate that <laughs> yes well this next picture is called i think it's called heirloom and yeah. um, this image could you explain the idea behind the art and genetics of this piece and i think we've got several yeah. pieces we're going to look at Yes, so Art and Genetics was um, an exhibition we did because we had a genetics conference in Dunedin and um, we also, um, so we, we had the chance to exhibit that at the opening night of that conference. So we had geneticists from around the world visiting and looking at these pieces and we worked, uh, I worked, collaborated with Pam McKinley on this one because she slowly reined me in by kind of <laughs> teasing me into this thing over a few years and um, so the uh, Dr. Julia Horsfield she has this thing that is called a heat map maybe you can go forward one slide for a moment because you see this graph there mm -hmm. and that is those graphs that they would have and I said yeah I can weave something like that and what the graph explains to them I have no idea what she's talking about but what it <laughs> explains to them is that you have, you have the 23 pairs of chromosome and they have the thelonoids on them and somehow they get switched on and off for some genetic information and that's where they turn red and white. And so what I did is I said, okay, 23 pairs of chromosomes. I made 23 little warps, one inch wide. I dyed them in oh. the red and white patterns randomly 
of course. And then I folded them over and wove them into this blanket, which it is a merino yarn for baby blankets, wove it with white. And then I took, I had different, because of the folding over of the warps, in the middle, the fringes were the shortest and on the edge, they were long. And so I, um, we call it twiddling when you have a fringe twister. So I twiddled all those fringes. Now we can go back to the previous slide, please. And I had all the, um, all those fringes on the blanket that were the longest in the middle and they were the thalonoids. And when your cells um, in your life, when your cells um, split, those things become shorter and shorter and shorter. And when, when the, the shortness is arrived, the shortest one is, is reached, you can't uh, split the cell anymore. And I had the best delight out of um, <laughs> this work when the, um, just get the loom around, just get the loom around. We have another weaver arriving. Oh, we're just having a twiddle. Can you just give me the twiddler, Sandra? Perfect. Because somebody <laughs> just uh, brought back in the twiddler. We have an open studio and people can just come in in the summer. So this is our French twister, which we call, um, which we call twiddling. And basically the, the biggest delight was, imagine you weave this thing just as a respond. You have no idea what the scientists really talk about, but you just bring in, you respond to their work. So my work is not science, but it's a response to their science. And those people, they were all talking about what was happening. And I had a weaving mistake in the chromosome number nine and I, Googled what's wrong with uh, chromosome number nine. And there's a skin condition called thalassemia or something like that. And I called it tessel mania. So I have the tessel mania. I made all these tessels and um, then a thread broke in chromosome number 16. And I put in a little piece of white thread. And I then learned that that is actually what they do in genetic editing. So I'm telling all the scientists that I did a genetic editing in chromosome number 16, and we have a, a, a defect in chromosome number nine. And, and then they said, um, they explained to me that this blanket is a girl because the most outside chromosomes were identical. And they said, if it was a boy, one side would be this short. And it was just really so funny to see all those um, all the scientists, like one of them said, excuse me for the language, but I think it's just okay. He said, you really took the piss, didn't you? <laughs> so, but, but at the same time, it gets people discussing about those things and maybe asking a few more questions about the science, which, yeah. yeah it's cool. Well, like I said at the beginning of this program, we were talking about how some artists you know, they have a science background. It's like, I feel like you really approached it from a different point of view of you, you did more, you got into the science with your artwork. And I love that. It's just amazing how you did the representation of that. And again, it's more yeah. about steam and then STEM. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And it is really, it's really responding with an artwork to the science. It's not like taking the science seriously. I mean, not not seriously, but literally. Right. It's like what 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 is the artist's response to it? And I was just recently, as many of you might know, Professor Brian Cox from the um, from the UK, who's talking about cosmology, and he's traveling around the world explaining the cosmos to people, and he's talking about the last thing that's happening past quantum theory and all this thing with the black holes and. And they can measure measure today what Einstein had as a theory. And he's telling, showing us all the images and the proof of why that is. And, and you sit there and, and, and they, to break up that talk, they had a comedian talking, like he would talk for 20 minutes and then the comedian would talk for 10 minutes. And the comedian <laughs> said, we got, a, um, we got a, a, a comment from somebody who said, you know, I don't like, we, we are hearing what stu physics students have 40 lectures about this. And the, we have one night presentation. And so this person said, I came out of your talk. I didn't really understand much of what you said at all, but on the way home, my 11 year old daughter explained it all to me. <laughs> and it's a little bit like that, you know, you pick up something and you just, with this childlike, not childish, but childlike mm -hmm. openness, you kind of approach it. And I really love that. 
and my teachers at design school I had one teacher um, who was fantastic and a Buchleiter Mr. Buchleiter and he said you know when children can draw and this whole thing of us saying we can't draw or so is because we have the censorship of what we want things to be but mm -hmm. just this playful way of being happy to make what you could call a mistake but taking it in as something that just happens in life and I I I loved that approach. You know, I'm not, mm -hmm. I have never thrived for perfection. I've just thrived for expression or something like that and curiosity and yeah, play. Well, I hope it was well received and that more people will, you know, think about putting art and science together like that. I, I think it's amazing that this conference did that. That's wonderful. I hope they yes, can and, and so all those catalogs about all of the art and science exhibitions are actually online. And so we have a format of a catalog where you have one page of hundred words of the scientist about their work and one page of hundred works of the artist about their work and one work and one photograph each. And so I, we, we have like, it was art and water, art and earth, art and genetics, art and space and art and... Yeah, Art and Earth was the previous one. Actually, that purple work at first was woven after a, a microscopic photograph of a 0.3 millimeter thin section of schist. And, and again, we had a geologist standing in front of the work and explaining what we saw here. So the purple is actually mica and there's all these different colors that are from, from the different minerals that are in the schist and in the conglomerate of those things. And so this was a work that was on a 16 shaft AVL loom and it was based on plain weave. And for the first time in years, I felt like I'm onto something here doing my more free work of experimentation and especially on the right a piece I felt really connected to Annie Albers. Oh, and I yeah. had just seen I had just seen a documentary on Annie Albers, and she said that the true art in textiles is to just make a piece of textile. You know, it's not about whatever and whatever, but just the textile. And I felt that with those two pieces here that I wove, that I I got that where I really. Yeah, got into the development of just putting structures and colors together and I'm I love cooking and the way I'm cooking is I don't ever cook after I mean I do sometimes but I normally don't cook after a recipe so I mm -hmm. take the, the ingredients and then I put a little bit of this and a little bit of that and say a bit more spicy a bit more sour we need a bit more of this and 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 I, I wasn't aware that other people don't do that until my brother-in-law recently said that, oh, you cook like an artist. And it was quite <laughs> funny because I'm like, yes, I actually probably am. And I, I, I think more and more, I think maybe I am really an artist. And, and this work is for me, it's woven like cooking, you know, a bit uh -huh. more of this color, a bit more of that thread. And I weave a little bit and then I change an AV alum you can, uh, and a compute dobby, you can change the structures just as you go. And I weave a little section and I say, oh, I really like that. And I want a bit more of that. And so, yeah. Well, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you was that when you design, do you plan everything out? Mandy, I'm, I'm messing up the, the screens here. So bear with us. When yeah, you design, already. is everything planned out? Or it sounds like maybe you kind of, you know, change as you go or design as you go. Is that true? Yeah, so it's different for different projects, but for oh, okay. this latest project, so I I don't design everything through, but basically, um, like for the for the project of the of the um, art and earth one there, I I feel like I'm giving a parameter, like it was based on plain weave. I had sixteen shafts and I broke them up in groups, and I basically. If, I, if you now think these are the shafts from one mm -hmm. to 16, I have like four groups of four shafts. And I had basically I had two warps. So I have a double weave and I had one, sh one warp was the structural warp. And that was on the, um, on the shafts in the middle. So shaft five to 
12. I know I mm -hmm. will lose some of you, but I will also win some others. <laughs> and so there were, there were um, those pieces. So that's the purple one again that I'm talking about now. Um, again, slide number, yes, that, yeah, the one, that one. And so basically um, the one layer was just on, on four shafts and four shafts where I always um, swapped between them and the other layers, they were on the one and four and 13 to 16. And they um, were giving me the ones that on the left-hand side there, they're basically only floating. They are not really bound in. So one warp is a fabric and the other warp is only floating above and below. And um, I, I did it quite randomly. So sometimes I would have one thread of one layer and one of the other, and then I would go as much as eight and eight. So like, which makes it into a deflected double weave if I would weave mm -hmm. both, both sides, but sometimes, like you see something where you in the in the toward the right of the piece you see something where you can really see like the pink and black stripes so mm -hmm. that it would have been stripes of eight and eight threads and um so i i just have in my head ideas of what could happen uh -huh. and then i start putting structures in there and i say i'm like oh yeah that's cool oh, oh and i like this one and what if i and i'm on those shots so and it is actually so complex in a way that I could not, I could not re reweave that piece. I could only weave a piece. Sorry, I'm just looking for the paper if I find <laughs> that, you know, but I could only reweave. Those who watch know this happens all the time that people just leave us. The, they come back. Yeah, it's okay. I think that finally, I don't find it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't find it here, but my whole, my whole, um, outline was one a four page with a photograph that on back uh -huh. and front had all these bundles of numbers that are absolutely gibberish to everybody but me and after a month or so would turn into gibberish to myself as well because I wouldn't remember anymore what brainwave was <laughs> there and I tried to grasp it and that's just enough to provide the the soil, so to say, for those little structures to grow on the fabric and hopefully come out. And I find well, that very exciting. And another way that, that you have incorporated science into some of your work is um, these dish towels that you did with, um, is it Sally Carson or Kaysen? She was the director of the Carson, Maritime yeah. Studies Centers, right? Yes, she's okay. a mar marine biologist. And Steve yeah. Ting is a marine biologist as well, of course. Steve Ting does everything. So anyway, yeah, yes, I did this. <laughs> yes, obviously. I did this um, series of tea towels because I was weaving tea towels at the time. And the way mm -hmm. that Pam McKinley got me into working on the art and science, the first one was that she actually hired me to weave tea towels for her. And that's how she coaxed me years and years ago. To, ah, that was okay. for art and space. That's okay. how she coaxed me to slowly become part of the series. And because I was so busy with other things, I, I didn't really um, have the time to do something else but tea towels. But for this one, it really made sense because this was the exhibition about art and water. And it was, they had one on art and ocean, but this one was river, mountain to seas. And you see on here um, what is called a river plume. And that is at the um, river mouth where the river goes into the ocean. You see all the sediment coming out of the river and washing into the ocean. And you can see in the tea towels on the un, um, out of focus tea towel that has exactly those colors. So mm -hmm. it had all the colors from the sand to the, and actually we have one that shows that, that are here. I can hold you one up as well where you can see the whole tea towel. So it has the colors. And of course oh, that wow. would be planned, you know, that is planned. So I took the colors from the photograph and, um, I think I, lo I love colors. So I think I did quite a good job to, um, yes, you can go back to the big one now that you've seen that. Thank you very much. Um, but the, the science behind this one is that if we don't look after the land and we, especially when we have lots of dairy on the land mm -hmm. um, and the cows are trampling that and, um, and we cut the wood, cut the forests and stuff, then the, 
the rain and the snow, melting snow and everything washes the sediment into the river and that gets washed into the ocean. And then at the river mouth, I don't know if we, that's probably the only photograph we have of that, but at the river mouth live all these, wow. uh, all these beautiful animals that actually have the colors. And so these were like this, the stripy ones, they are colors of a starfish. This is a cockle. And uh, oh yeah, there are some. So the, 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 the ones that are just two colors, like dark light, dark light and stuff, they are the colors of the starfish. Then there is the cockle that is gray to brown. Then the yellow to red is a sea tulip. The green is sea lettuce. And so the, this is like, um, I say, think while you wash your dishes, we need to change. So it's a bit of a statement against mass production. And if you have a hand woven tea towel, then you can't, uh, you can't afford too many, so you better look after your things. And so on the label, <laughs> it had the, um, it says actually has an internet link to a live um, camera webcam on that, on an aquarium where all those animals are. So they really? have as an education tool and that, yeah. Oh, that's and great. So, and so basically the whole thing was you can only buy the couple of tea towels together. You could not buy just one because <laughs> they belong together. And on the label, it says, think while you do your dishes, we need to change. So I'm trying to, here's my social outreach again. I'm a political outreach. I'm trying to make people think about that everything is entangled with everything, which is again, actually a theory out of the cosmology. So everything is connected with everything and what we do, everything has a consequence. And I think we, we need to get away from the mass production. We need to get away from wanting to have so much. Yes. And so in teaching my people here weaving, I also try to teach a little bit the value of just taking your time to make a little object rather than buying everything so like we I think that the that our gener my generation I'm in my mid 50s and the following generation that we we got trained to buy the solutions of any problem that arises and I think that is a bad way to go I think we need to start to be the solutions of our problems and to make think about solutions and make solutions and stuff well, I, I love that you've you've come back full circle to what we started with about your three pillars, you know, of um, that these aren't just beautiful hand towels, which they are, but the idea of staying away from the mass production of the science of what we're doing to our environment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate, you know, you explaining that. And it's great to see those come back again, that whole circle of coming back to those three pillars. That's wonderful. Yes, and, and what my weaving students hear, hear much more than they want to hear about <laughs> is my recent project <laughs> that I'm, I'm trying to encourage people and encourage our culture to change into, um, into using uh, reusable or more healthy mm -hmm. menstrual products. So I'm actually oh, trying really? to educate people about a way because I was just sitting there one day and think like, what can we do? We hear about all these things like climate change and everything. And they say, if people don't do things, they feel they just panic and they stall. And it's a, such a too big problem of, uh, and people don't do anything. And I think if if people just focus on a little thing that they can do, then we can actually make a change as a whole. And so I am I put together kits with all the kind of um, whatever, it's five things you can do. You can use um, organic tampons, organic pads, undies, cups, and reusable pads. And I'm teaching people how to make huh. reusable pads. And I, um, I show people the cups and the undies and I show people the other ones because they're in the plastic ones. Not only don't they ever disintegrate, but also they have plastic chemicals in them that get absorbed by the body. And I didn't even know how yeah. big the subject was and how lots of women actually get very unhealthy from using the tampons and the... So that's my little spiel. I know we wanna talk about weaving, but 
the the project is called so on and my website to that one is still a bit uh, rudimentary but um, rudimentary but um, watch that spot because the idea is that you can everybody can start little groups of making pets for themselves so the, the thing is that it oh, doesn't okay. need to be expensive or you can buy them from a project like this and therefore finance that other people who can't afford those products can get them it's really good to have a buy one give one away or something system because there is lots of um, um, menstrual poverty and women that still can't go to work or school because they don't really have all the means to deal with stuff and they don't mm -hmm. maybe have the education and I'm working with a project in Nigeria because my sister-in-law is from Cameroon and we started charity there uh, because all the Cameroonian refugees are at the moment there. So I'm trying to actually have the project that I'm setting up in New Zealand, have that project double up at the same time in Nigeria so that the people there learn to make pets for themselves at the same time and learn about cups at the same time as I'm teaching the people here. And um, so the idea is that it can multiply wherever. And if anybody wants to take that on over there, be my guest. You know, it's like because it doesn't now the, take much. The website is called So On, like S E W O On. S E W and then O N, because it's like you can sew your own solution. So right. we started okay. a sewing group so on and it might get a different name it's a working title at the moment but it is um <laughs> it's part of my website so you find it on the christine keller website and, and it once will again change. you heard it here first i don't know about you all but this is first i've heard of this it, it sounds brilliant i'm gonna have to check it out after we get off the air yes, it sounds wonderful thank you for sharing that and even though it's not weaving it is fiber so there you go it is fiber. It's totally fiber. And that's why that's why my part is mainly teaching sewing. But um, there is lots of I want it's, it's really it should be a multidisciplinary thing. We need health people and chemists and marketing people. I would love somebody to help me how to make a really good non for profit out of it. And it needs mm -hmm. to be open source and it needs to create work for people. And I think it can. And yes, so watch the spot. All right, thank you. And thank you for putting it out there, you know, putting it out in the universe to say, you know, you want yeah, this. Thanks to, for to giving say, me the opportunity. Yeah, that's good. So what are the other slides? We have more slides. Well, I wanted to ask you something about, um, cause you were born in Germany, but now you yeah. live on an island in New Zealand, right? So yes. how, I mean, that's really different. I mean, just visually it's different. I know friends who live on islands. Your life is different when you live on an island. So how do you think having those two different kind of environments impacted on your work, the work you did there versus the work you're doing now? Um, so yes, first of all, I love my family. I'm a really good family person. And Louise will know that because she has visited my family in Hamburg. And um, Dunedin, where I live, is the furthest away city in the world from my hometown, Hamburg. Oh. It's over 18,800 kilometers away. And that in itself is, is weird for me because um, I always have to think of my geography teacher who told me that 20,000 <laughs> kilometers is exactly opposite. And I'm like, I almost made it. And I'm so scared of flying. I thought I would never fly in my life. But um, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think that the island as such has, has made such a difference. But the thing, what is, what is different in New Zealand is we are so far away. We are a country that has the size of Germany, but the population of Quebec, which is about 5 million people, or at least that was in oh. Quebec when I used to live there. So 5 million people in the country that size. And and what it does, and that's maybe where my activism comes from and where making the loom room comes from, is like I, I started to dance tango. I can explain it with that best. I started to dance tango. The tango teacher left back to Argentina and we kept the tango group going by paying the rent and paying. So the thing is, it is such a small community in my city, which is a, the whatever, fifth biggest city in New Zealand or something. Yes fifth biggest city in New Zealand, we have about 130,000 people here. 
and we have a symphony orchestra and all that. And the thing is, if there's something not existing, you have to do it or it's not there, you know? And if you live in a place like Montreal or Hamburg or I don't know, in a bigger city, there is 50,000 of everything. There is 20 or 30 groups that you may not even find of what you want to do. And I, I was always too shy to go to those places. But here it's like, if you want something, you make it. Mm. We go to the folk festival tomorrow. I'm on the organizing team because the people I met when I arrived here 15 years ago, they are the organizing team of the 40 year long tradition of having this folk festival. So that is the change. It's like the, in the big crowd, you don't notice that your work can make a difference. But believe me, if you reach out online and you reach out to a few people and you just keep on talking to one subject, your work can make a difference. And I think that is still true for the big places too, but you get easier sidetracked. Mm. So... Mm -hmm. And you don't believe that it makes a difference because there are so many other people who are out there too. But actually, I don't know, maybe I'm maybe maybe it's an illusion, but actually I think it can make a difference. Well, one thing I do want to talk about before we end today is your beautiful studio and that you, again, it's one of your three pillars, but that you decided that you wanted to offer a space to people to come and weave and learn about fiber and, and you know, it's an incredible space. I have I, me and everybody else watching has space envy just looking at this. But can you talk some about why you decided you wanted to offer a space for people to come and weave? Yes, that's actually very easy. Go to the next one, please, because I have lost seven kilos since that photograph. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. So there is a very easy answer to that and the answer is i don't like to work alone and oh. basically i i got i i'm a person who spent lots of years of their life feeling very lonely oh. and i i lost um i lost the working at the polytechnic here there was no teaching classes anymore all the looms were in storage and i bought a loom i bought an avl loom from my redundancy money that was a loom from another polytechnic that closed the department. And then I bought six little table looms online on, on Trade Me, which is like just one of our local um, um, secondhand platform to buy things. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I rented a place three hours a week and everybody got a loom and they put the loom in the car and then drove away. And I had one box of books and one box of yarns and tools. Wow. And um, and then for the next few years, I had the vision that I wanted a place where I could work on my own work and teach. And I just was a pain in the butt for so many people by just sitting there and say, but I need this, I need this, I need this. And then in the end, this room that you see here with those yellow um, yellow roof thing that's built it is built like a gazebo or like a tent into a warehouse space and um, I basically built that so it was months and months of work and and the, the reason I have it is that money was never my concern I just said I just do the work and I know that is a luxury but um, I said that the heavens provide i'm not a religious person but i needed money to buy a, to build a loom and i found believe it or not i found on a in the local rubbish i found a little bit of a broken um how are they called um vibraphone that was probably an insurance damage and the the wooden frame on the vibraphone was broken but other than that it was brand new i bought it for 80 dollar like the guy said 100 bucks and then i said it's broken 80 dollar you know bought this vibraphone googled it it was worth seven thousand dollar new wow. and um a local at the folk club there's three three local guitar makers and one of them said i repair it for you no problem no charge I said, if I sell it, do you want money? He said, no. So I gave him a bucket with wine and crackers and cheese and stuff and <laughs> sold it to the local university music department for three and a half thousand dollars. And I said, I found this in the rubbish. It's the best instrument we have in the whole. It's a concert quality brand new instruments from France. 
And that's the money I had. And then I was on welfare at that point. And they said, where's the $3,500 in your business plan? Where did the money come from? And I said, I sold a musical instrument. There's not income. They can't say anything about it. So I, I, I had a business plan that I slowly built out of unemployment. And I just stuck with my vision. And it takes long time and you grow really slowly, 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 but just one step. And my teacher, I had a teacher at university who was very mean to me in my first studies. And I, I was never, the, I wasn't elegant enough. I wasn't fast enough. I wasn't successful and not chic enough, I think, to be a designer. But he said, you're like an ant. And I say that as a compliment. You know, because I never stopped. I just went and walked and walked and walked and walked. And so, and, and believe it or not, I'm a really depressed person by personality. But the only thing that keeps me over water is just this going toward my um, my thing. And I mean, the way that I got into Canada, Luis, I might just say that briefly too. Luis and I were together at, an, at a class with Yunichi Arai, this very famous Japanese designer in 1994. I was just... Um, freshly from my degree from university and the class was supposed to be in English but because we were all Germans and Louise the class was in, in German and she was sitting next to me and I translated because I just bubbled on and then I showed her my um, I showed her my work from my thesis which was all about weaving and felting and structure and texture and um, and the next morning she said, um, like, um, uh, I can hire you. Like I have this little grant and eight weeks later I was her assistant and, and thank you very much. And it was on a, on a low basis to start, but it was, was that. And then I went back to Germany. And when I came to Canada the second time to do my master's at Concordia, somebody told me about the scholarship HGA, uh, HGA had and I got that. And then I got a scholarship for just paying the Montreal fee, like the Quebecois fee. And I had a I had gotten a five thousand dollar award from from Germany, and then a four thousand dollar award from HGA. And then I got the award that I only needed to pay Quebec fees. And suddenly, my fees were paid for my masters. I think I owed them another one thousand dollar or so, and that was it for the two years. So. Thanks very much for everybody, but it's like somehow, I don't know how it works, but if you really focus and you really want it and do it, and, and my classes are quite full. Like, so I have waiting lists, I have 28 students. I have classes wow. where people just come three hours a week. And um, more importantly than the weaving and the weaving classes is the community. And we have become our little local book club, or we talk about the, the health of our pets or about dance classes or whatever. And then somebody says, oh, my thread broke. And I, I'm saying like, what, you have a question about weaving? You know, so we laugh. Um, and of course it's about weaving, but it is, uh, it's, it's about so much more. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a home away from home. And it's really because I didn't like to work by myself and so I wanted the community so yeah well we have several questions um let's yeah. hit some of them before we stop for the day how's that um yes um Kathleen Phelan wants to know where do you get your yarns and is it a sustainable source especially the the dyeing of it the strong colors so good question um um could you take do you have Sandra's number can you take yeah. some? Oh no, forget it. Okay, I just had a request <laughs> here. Sorry for that. So um, these beautiful cottons behind me are from Brassard because cotton is a hard thing to get in, in, in Quebec. Cotton is a hard thing to come by in, in New Zealand. So um, when I left Canada, I took all the expensive wool and left the cheap cotton behind. But of course here the wool is cheap and the cotton is expensive. So um, I am dying sometimes, so I'm not, I am not on the 100% everything is 100% ecological, totally without any harm and stuff. I, um, as this weaving center here, I often get stashes from people. So when we weave, and I 
do take this uh, up now. When we weave, we have, um, this is my weaving storage. So we have lots of yarns that are still there. And I mean, look, I, I drive an electric car, but it's not so everybody should get an electric car tomorrow because we need to use up the cars we still have too. And so we are using the yarns that we have. Yeah. And um, I tell everybody to, I think that a mix between natural and not natural fiber is the most damaging thing uh, because that cannot be recycled or so. So I, I encourage people to use 100% natural materials. I um, People are at the moment, they are into eco printing. So we're learning a bit about eco printing and then I will tell them what to do. We don't do much dyeing. When we dye, we dye with acid dyes with only vinegar. Mm, so okay. and put a bit of um, baking soda and to neutralize it before we go out and uh, so it's not all 100% great but it is it's like when I make the sanitary pads they have one layer of polyurethane coated polyester in it but this one layer of plastic in the pad is preventing maybe 150 other pads to be used you know so mm -hmm. and and for me what it was is um, if I put all the weight of you can't do this and you can't do that and this is like this has a bad this yarn has a bad consequence there and whatever I get so overwhelmed with the whole system that I think there also needs to be some fun to give me energy again to do other things so yes I am aware of um, of all this um, ecological chaos we are in but I also so I don't like to use things that have 50% acrylic in them or something like that another question um they want to know some uh Sandra Miller wants to know how did you connect with the scientist that you did the artwork with that's the curator of the shows that has a call for that exhibition and she finds the scientists and there's like 20 scientists and 20 artists and we are speed dating three minutes each <laughs> speed dating i like that okay lynn summerstein wants to know is it possible to get copies or at least see that catalog you were talking about where they had the artwork and the science side by side yes you can if you if you go to the otago polytechnic website and go into their research website. We can probably, I find you a link and then you can Google that. There is a link where all the research work of this universe of the Polytechnic is in there and all the catalogs are online and all the photo galleries are online. Good question, thanks. And that's the O-T-A-G-O Polytech? Yeah, Otago okay. is our region. It's like our state, it's like Georgia, it's Otago. You know, Georgia, I'm impressed. That's good. Um, I've got Georgia in my mind. <laughs> uh, Debbie Reinflesch said, the, this water chemist and biologist loves it. Thanks for the great idea. You're, you're planting the Thank seed you. as you go. Um, Thank you. Martha Shimkin said, I love the two tea towels and the photographs of the starfish and the other li sea life. Um, I'm wondering if you would be willing to share the photo. I'm not sure what she means by that. Um, she the photo says, is I'm online. Oh, it's online. Okay. Uh, I manage the environmental protection of the Chesapeake Bay that largely focuses on the sediment and nutrients from farming and urban runoff. I would love to show your photograph and your thoughts about sediment flow into rivers and consciousness raising. If that's on your website, that answers my questions. Thanks. Martha, I think you need to talk with Christine. You guys need to get together. That sounds like a, a, a great relationship, the beginning of a wonderful relationship, beautiful relationship. <laughs> um, and then somebody commented on the pads that um, she's delighted that you're working on the sustainable menstrual pads or products. There's a nonprofit organization called Days for Girls that's a similar focus, mm -hmm. and that churches would like to, yeah. Yeah. And Sorry. in Missouri have produced products and sent them to different countries. Yes, the, the thing about Days for Girls, which is great, is that 
the approach uh, that I find a bit yesteryear about it, it's a very colonial approach because, and I know I might upset people here now, but it is like um, rich women in the first world sending pets to the poor girls in the second or third world. Uh -huh. And I think what we need to embrace is that we need the pets for ourselves too, because mm -hmm. we are causing the damage with the plastic we use. Mm -hmm. And we need to enable the people in the other countries to make a, make a bit of an economy by making their own. So send over the sewing machines and the patterns. That's what mm -hmm. we do in Nigeria so that people can make their own. And it's, it's really good to send some pets, but I know that Days for Girls is not allowed anymore to send pets to Uganda because they say, if you give them for free, then we can't make an economy with them anymore. We can't make our pets and sell them because they get the, from somewhere else for free. And make the pattern for Days for Girls, please, please, please open source. They have a patent or a copyright on the pattern and nobody is allowed to use it. And I think everybody needs pets. If you don't sell them, let other people make them for not for profit. Good point, good point. Well, Christine, I can't believe it, but it we're, we're done for the day. It's time to stop. Thank you so yes. much for being on here today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, yes. I hope we'll see you again soon. Like maybe next fall and we'll get a tour of your studio. Yeah, very happy to have that. Yes, thank you so much. And um, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. I hope uh, you're not too cold over there. And thanks for coming, <laughs> what we call between the years. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. I want to, if you want to know more about Christine Keller, go to her website. There's tons of information there. Um, and if you're curious about, I know a lot of people ask questions today. We didn't get to them all, but go to her website and I'm sure you'll get a lot more information and you can talk, contact her too. We got to get Martha Shimkin and you together. That's going to be important. So thank you all so much. And I do want to thank our sponsor. Um, again, our, our lovely um, sponsor. Sponsors who come and donate so that we can keep these great programs going. Mar Myrna Lindstrom, Myrna, you're, you're an angel. You're a textiles and tea angel, and we appreciate it. If you've missed any of the programs, they are on uh, Facebook Live. You can watch them there. You're on Facebook, the HGA Facebook page. You can watch them there. They're up on YouTube, and you can see them there. Um, if you are... Again, we're, we're very we are very grateful to the people who donate. If you're interested in donating, we still have time for the end of the year. Um, we are a 501c3. If you're looking to um, donate to get your tax uh, right off before the end of the year, you still have time to donate to HTA because your donations through Fiverr Trust or donating to sponsor textiles and tea. These are the ways that we keep our programs going. Um, it's what covers our costs for the magazine and um, uh, the resort, the uh, retreat for the guilds or all the other programs that we have it's spinning and weaving week. All of those things are funded by the generous donations that you make to um, the Fiverr Trust. If you're interested, you can call us or you can go online at weavespindie.org and you can donate there. And we greatly appreciate all your donations. Um, next week, we have Chris Acton. We're excited to have Chris. She'll be our first guest of the new year. And I hope you all have a wonderful and very safe New Year's Eve this weekend. Thank you all so much. Have a great week and happy tea.